everybody. Uh, I have a new presentation for you today and I hope you like it. Uh, the title of the presentation, How can pharmacists optimize drug therapy for geriatric patients? Uh, actually, this is a very important topic because uh, we have so many patients uh, that come to the pharmacy and we need to make sure that we are giving them the right medication, the right dose, and also to make sure that drug therapy for the seniors is safe and effective at the same time. So the population of uh, people age 65 and above has been increasing uh, in general and particularly in Canada because of the excellent healthcare system we have in Canada. Now, there are some physiological changes that uh, develop with the advancing of the age. And here we are going to talk about two uh, categories of these changes, the changes that affect the pharmacodynamic of the drugs. And what we mean by pharmacodynamic, uh, the uh, action of the drug, how the drug produce, produces its effect. And also we are going to talk about the physiological changes that affect the pharmacokinetics of the medication. And with pharmacokinetics, we mean how the drug is absorbed, how the drug is metabolized in the body, and how the drug is eliminated from the body. So both uh, improving and maintaining the functional status is highly important for geriatric care. Now, drug-related problems, or we call them DRP, are very common in the elderly, and sometimes they could precipitate morbidity, and unfortunately, in some cases, they could lead to uh, mortality. Now, the pharmacist can optimize drug therapy, can prevent drug-related problems, okay? And when we talk about the pharmacotherapy for the elderly or the drug therapy for the seniors, uh, the aim of the medications or the pharmacotherapy, uh, uh, one of them is to cure diseases. And also we may use a drug therapy to palliate diseases or to enhance the HRQOL, the health related quality of life. This is very important, the health-related quality of life. Now, the health-related quality of life uh, for the elderly, uh, we need to take into consideration, uh, first of all, to improve the physical functioning, okay, which will improve the daily activities of the seniors. Second, the second consideration is to improve the psychological function of the senior in order to improve cognition and to improve depression. Uh, another consideration is to improve the social functioning, which is very important 
for various social activities. Now, let's talk about the physiological changes that develop with the advancing of age. Now, when we look at the body composition, we see that there is a decrease in the total body water. Okay, that's for the seniors and the elderly people. Also, in the elderly people, we have a decrease in the body mass. And also, there will be an increase in the body fat. And possibly, there might be a decrease in the level of serum albumin. Now, when you come to the cardiovascular system, there will be a decrease in the myocardial sensitivity to the beta adrenergic stimulation. And also, there will be a decrease in the baroreceptor activity. And the cardiac output is expected to decrease, but the total peripheral resistance will increase and that means we will have more vasoconstriction in the peripheral blood vessels and this is one of the causes of the elevation of the blood pressure in some seniors or elderly people. Now when we come to the central nervous system in the elderly uh, there is a decrease in the brain weight there is a decrease also in the volume of the brain and possibly there are cognition alterations or changes. Now, when we come to the hormones or to the endocrine system, uh, there will be atrophy in the thyroid gland and there will be an increased risk of diabetes mellitus and also elderly have increased risks of developing thyroid disease and of course one of the uh, aging process will lead to menopause and as you know menopause will be associated with a fluctuation in various hormones particularly the female hormone which we call it the estrogen Okay, and that will lead to the uh, manifestation or the symptoms of the menopause. Now, when you come to the gastrointestinal tract, uh, the gastric pH is expected to increase and the blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract is expected to decrease and possibly there will be delayed gastric emptying a condition we call it gastroparesis and also there will be a slowing in the intestinal transit. Now regarding the genitourinary tract, uh, females uh, have vaginal atrophy because the female hormone, the estrogen, is decreased and for males it is expected to have a prosta prostatic hypertrophy due to the androgenic hormonal changes. And this is due to the activation of the cells in the prostate by the dihydrotestosterone. And this could lead to BPH and possibly to prostate cancer. And also the elderly in general uh, may suffer from incontinence. Now for the immune system, definitely with the advancing of the age, uh, the immune system will be compromised, particularly the cell medi mediated immune responses will be compromised in the elderly. Now for the liver, the uh, size of the liver is expected to decrease with the advancing of age and also 
the blood supply, sorry, or blood flow to the liver is expected to decrease. Now, when you come to the oral cavity, uh, seniors have a decreased ability to taste the sweetness, soreness, bitterness, and also there might be some changes in the dentition. Now, with the pulmonary system, okay, there will be a decrease in the respiratory muscle strength, and also there will be a decrease in the chest wall complaints, and also there will be a decrease in the alveolar surface, and a decrease in the vital capacity, and a decrease in the maximal breathing capacity. Now for the kidneys or the renal system, the glomerular filtration rate is expected to decrease and also the renal blood flow or the blood supply to the kidney is expected also to decrease. However, the filtration fraction may increase and there will be a decrease in the tubular secretory function and a decrease in the renal mass. Now, for the sensory system, uh, there will be a decrease in the lens accommodation and that may cause uh, uh, farsightedness. The person uh, can uh, see uh, to the, uh, from a distance, but difficult uh, to see when reading a book or a paper. And also, some seniors may suffer from a priest by cuisis, which is loss of the auditory acuity or defect in the hearing uh, function. Uh, also, there might be a decrease in the conduction velo uh, velocity. Now, for the skeletal system, uh, there will be a decrease in the skeletal bone mass and this condition is described medically as osteopenia. Now for the skin and hair, there will be dryness in the skin, uh, wrinkling in the skin, uh, some pigmentation changes and also thinning in the epithelial cells of the skin of course. Uh, also, there will be loss of the dermal thickness, uh, a decrease in the number of hair follicles, and also a decrease in the melanocyte number in the hair bulbs. So, the progressive decline in the organ function uh, is uh, one of the consequences of the aging or the advancing of age. Now, when you come to the age associated physiological changes, uh, there will be uh, a reduction in the FRC, the functional reserve capacity, and also there will be a reduction uh, in the ability to preserve homeostasis or hemostasis. Now, the FRC is the ability to respond to physiological changes and to stress. So, when we have defective hemostasis and reduction in the FRC, uh, that will lead to decompensation in stressful situations. So the elderly in general need approximately 95% of the remaining FRC to respond to physiological changes and to stressful conditions. Now, when there is a significant a reduction in the FRC uh, that could affect the cardiovascular system, the musculoskeletal system, and the central nervous system. 
So when we have defective hemostatic mechanism in the elderly, uh, that could lead to postural stability, could affect this uh, postural stability, and also may affect the gait stability, and also may affect the orthostatic blood pressure responses. And also, this could affect the thermoregulation or the body temperature, and also the cognitive reserve could be effective in addition to the effect on the bowel function and the bladder function. Now, a minor stress in the elderly with an impaired FRC could precipitate morbidity or mortality. Now, let's talk about the age-related changes in a drug pharmacokinetics. We'll talk about the absorption, metabolism, and elimination of medications. So we start, first of all, with the drug absorption. Okay, usually the passive diffusion uh, for the absorption of medication in the elderly is not affected. And therefore, the drug bioavailability will not be effective as far as we are talking about the drugs that are absorbed by passive diffusion. If the drug is absorbed by passive diffusion, its bioavailability will not be affected in the elderly. When we come to the active uh, transport system, uh, drugs that are absorbed by the active transport system are affected, okay? Because this system will be defective somehow or will be compromised, and therefore this will lead to a decrease in the bioavailability of the drugs that are absorbed by the active transport system. Now, for certain drugs, there will be a decrease in the phase pass extraction because we mentioned before there will be a decrease in the blood flow to the liver, a decrease in the uh, mass of the liver and for medications that undergo uh, metabolism or we call it phase uh, pass extraction in the liver we expect the bioavailability will be increased not decreased because of the changes in the liver now when you come to the distribution of medications Okay, the volume, uh, the, uh, or the, or the, call it the apparent volume of distribution is usually decreased, and that will lead to an increase in the plasma concentration of water soluble drugs. Why? Uh, because here the uh, extra cellular fluid is decreased. So the distribution in the water or in the extra cellular fluid will also be decreased and therefore the level of the drug in the plasma will go higher. So here we are talking about drugs that are water soluble. However, when we come to drugs that are fat soluble, uh, there will be an increase here in the volume of distribution because the fat in the elderly is increased. There will be more fat and there will be more distribution of the drug uh, in, the, uh, in the fat and that could affect the elimination, the elimination half-life here 
will be increased because uh, uh, less drug will be available in the plasma. Uh, again, uh, the increase or decrease uh, uh, in uh, free fraction uh, uh, could be associated with highly plasma uh, protein binding drugs. So here depending whether the plasma proteins are elevated or are decreased and that will affect the, uh, the free fraction, the uh, fraction of the medication that is not bound to the plasma proteins. Now, regarding the metabolisms of drugs in the liver, okay, the clearance uh, of some medication, particularly those that are metabolized by oxidation in the liver, okay, we expect here there will be decrease in the clearance and increase or prolongation in the uh, half-life of the drug. This is applicable to uh, drugs that are metabolized in the liver by oxidation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there will be a high hepatic extraction ratio when the clearance of the medication is decreased and an increase uh, with the half-life of the drug. Now, let's move now to the uh, renal excretion. So, the clearance will be decreased, the elimination half-life is increased, and this is applicable to the drugs that are eliminated renally. And also, this is applicable to the active metabolites. Now, let's talk in more details about drug absorption. So, as we know, most drugs are taken orally, okay? And the aging process uh, can affect the physiology of the gastrointestinal drug uh, and this will affect the absorption of medications. So most drugs are absorbed by passive diffusion and as we mentioned before the bioavailability of these drugs will not be affected, okay? Although we have age-related changes. Now, a few drugs are absorbed by the active transport mechanism, and here the age-related changes uh, are expected to be associated with decreased bioavailability for drugs that are absorbed by the active transport mechanism. Now, when there is a decrease in the phase pass effect due to metabolism in the liver and in the gut, that will increase the bioavailability of the medication. And this is applicable to morphine and to propranolol. Now also we have to take into consideration the effect of a grapefruit juice because a grapefruit juice inhibits cytochrome P3A4 and that will lead to inhibition in the metabolism of the medication and the uh, active drug will be high in the serum and this could lead to an exaggerated pharmacological effect. Now let's move to drug distribution. 
So drug distribution here depends on many factors. The factors that affect uh, distribution of medications include blood flow, uh, pl plasma protein binding, and also body composition. Now, for the lipophilic drugs, okay, uh, the lipophilic drugs, the drugs that dissolve in fat or in lipid, there will be an increase in the apparent volume of distribution. Okay, why? Because as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, when people get older, the fat will increase in the body. So when the fat is increased, the, we, the drug will be distributed in this fat and therefore the volume of distribution of lipophilic drugs is expected to increase. On the other hand, when we come to water-soluble drugs, and because the volume of the extracellular fluid uh, uh, is decreased, we expect a decrease in the distribution of the drug in the extracellular fluid, and that will lead ultimately to a decreased volume of distribution. Uh, of course, the changes that occur in the volume of distribution can affect the loading dose. Okay? If we have an increase in the VD or decrease, we have to adjust the dose that will be administered in the uh, senior or in the elderly patient. Uh, another factor here, we call it the P-glycoprotein. This is an efflex transporter, okay, that may influence a drug transport uh, through the blood-brain barrier. In other words, the glycoprotein or P glycoprotein, okay, facilitate the removal of medications and toxins and chemicals in general from the brain. Okay, so in the elderly, the, this uh, P glycoprotein in the brain is decreased. Okay, so we expect that the levels of the drug remaining in the brain will be higher because th there will be less that is taken out by the P glycoprotein and this is applicable to drugs in general and also to toxins. Now the aging process can also influence the levels of major plasma proteins which usually bind drugs and this is applicable to albumin and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. So when the uh, serum albumin is decreased, okay, the free drug will be increased because there will be less albumin to bind the medication and this is applicable to some medication like naproxen which is used as anti-inflammatory drug and tolibutamide which is used in the treatment of diabetes mellitus and phenytoin for seizures and warfarin as a blood thinner. So we have to be careful here not to give high doses to seniors, okay, because this could lead to higher incidence of side effects. Now, the other protein is called the alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, and this protein can be induced by burns, cancer, trauma, and also 
it can be induced by inflammatory disorders. Now, when alpha-1 acid glycoprotein is increased, that will lead to a decrease in the free fraction of the drug because more drug will be bound to the alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, so the free drug remaining will be less. And this is applicable to basic drugs like lidocaine, propranolol, kinidine, and imipramine. So sometimes reporting the total drug level in patients with compromised excretory pathways could be misleading. So here we have to check the free fraction, the bound fraction, and, and the total level to have a clear idea what's going on with that medication. Now we move next to drug metabolism. Uh, as we know, the liver is the major organ for drug metabolism. And there are two phases of metabolism in the liver the oxidative phase, and this is called phase one, and the conjugative phase, phase two. So drugs are oxidized, and then the uh, metabolite is conjugated to a glucuronic acid. So there is some inter-individual variability in the hepatic function particularly in the elderly, and uh, the variation actually in the elderly is more re remarkable than in other ages. So when we come to the age-related decline of phase one metabolism, this could be attributed to the reduced volume of the liver. Also, the age-related de decline regarding phase one metabolism is not due to reduce hepatic enzymatic activity. It is due to the reduction in the volume of the liver, but not to the uh, uh, hepatic enzymatic activity. So, uh, the decreased Phase one metabolism in the liver, uh, such as the hydroxylation and the dealkylation, could lead to a decrease in the clearance of the drug. And when the clearance of the drug is decreased, the elimination half life will be increased. And this is applicable to diazepam, theophylline, peroxicam, peroxicam is anti-inflammatory drug, and to, kin uh, to kinidine. Now, with the advancing of age, there is no uh, decrease on phase two metabolism. And phase two metabolism includes glucose renidation and acetylation and this is applicable to lorazepam and oxazepam so if a senior needs a benzodiazepine derivative for anxiety or for insomnia we prefer lorazepam or oxazepam uh, not diazepam uh, also, with the advancing of age, there will be no effect on enzyme induction. Still, rifampicin or rifampine and phenytoin can induce enzymes, and of course, induction of enzymes will lead to drug-drug interaction. So, this mechanism is not affected by the aging process. Also, with the advancing of age, 
there is no effect on enzyme inhibition. Still, the uh, uh, drugs that inhibit the enzymes like fluoroquinolones, macrolide, and cimetidine, they do the same job in the seniors as in the young people. So also we have to take into consideration the drug-drug interaction that may develop. Now, with the advancing of age, there is a decrease in the blood supply to the liver, and that could affect the metabolism of some drugs, like especially those uh, that undergo high hepatic extraction ratios, including lidocaine, morphine, propranolol, and imipramine. Also, with the advancing of age, there is a significant decrease in the enzymatic activity of cytochrome P3A4. However, with the advancing of age, the other isoenzymes of the cytochrome uh, involved in metabolism of medication are not effective, including uh, cytochrome P2D6 and cytochrome P2C9, and also the acetylation process is not affected. So the metabolism of drugs in the liver for the elderly could be affected by many factors, including the race, the frailty, the diet, the sex, the smoking, and also drug-drug interaction. Now let's move to the drug elimination. Approximately 30% of normal, healthy, elderly have no decrease in the creatinine clearance, 30% only. Now the renal tubular secretion does not decline with the advancing of age. Now, when we come to determine the uh, creatinine clearance for the medication, we usually use uh, the Cockcroft and Gold equation, and this equation is used in adults who have stable renal function, and when the actual body weight is within 30% of the ideal body weight. So if you look at this equation to determine the creatinine clearance of the medication, and uh, he, uh, sorry, uh, in order to adjust the dose of the medication, so the uh, equation here for uh, males, uh, 140 minus the age in years, multiply by the actual body weight in kilogram divided by 72 times the uh, serum creatinine concentration in milligram per deciliter and if we want to apply this equation to women we multiply the final result by 0 0.85 and we can determine the creatinine clearance of the kidney and according to the creatinine cleanliness, we can determine the dose to be given to the patient. Now, with the advancing of age, usually there is a reduction in the renal elimination and also in the total body elimination. And this could affect many drugs like amantadine, atinolol, and so many other drugs, as you can see in this slide. Now, the hepatically metabolized drugs, which are converted in the liver to active metabolites, and then these metabolites are excreted in the kidney, they could accumulate in the elderly because of the a decrease or uh, in the renal function and this is applicable to N-acetylprocanamide 
uh, normipridine and to morphine 6 glucuronide okay now let's talk about an important issue here we call it a clinical controversy uh, some uh, clinicians okay uh, they use the Cockcroft and uh, Gold equation uh, to estimate the creatine creolis in the elderly. And then they round up the value they get to 1 if uh, serum creatinine concentration is below 1. And of course, this definitely will lead to improper dose adjustment and it may expose the patient to harmful effects. So after talking about the pharmacokinetics, now we move next to the pharmacodynamic, okay, and the effect of the aging process on the pharmacodynamic of medications in the elderly. So the age-related changes in a drug response could be due to alterations in the number of receptors or to the sensitivity of the receptors or to the post-receptor effect and possibly to the homeostatic mechanisms. Now, with the advancing of age, usually there is a decrease in the density of certain receptors, such as the muscarinic receptors, the parathyroid hormone receptors, the beta adrenergic receptors, the alpha 1 adrenergic receptors, and the mu opioid receptors. So, also, we have to take into consideration that elderly are more sensitive to the CNS side effect of benzodiazepine derivatives and they need lower doses to avoid or to minimize these side effects. Also, the elderly are more responsive to opioids than the younger adults. Again, they need lower doses than the young people to avoid toxicity of opioids. Now, the pharmacokinetics of opioids uh, is similar uh, between young and old people. Now, the elderly are more responsive to heparin warfarin and thrombolytics and therefore we need to make sure that we are using the appropriate dose to avoid the bleeding. Uh, the elderly on the other hand are less responsive to a direct thrombin inhibitor called uh, zymilagatran. Now the elderly are less responsive to beta agonists like salbutamol or, and they are also less responsive to beta antagonists like for example uh, indiral or propranolol. Okay, now the decreased baroreceptor function in the elderly may prevent reflex tachycardia induced by vasodilators. For example, uh, young people uh, or non-seniors, when they take nifidipine, Adalat, uh, they have flushing and uh, also uh, they have uh, tachycardia or the pulse is in increase. And we co because the nifidipine is causing vasodilation in the peripheral blood vessels and the patient will develop a reflex in the heart. We call it reflex tachycardia. 
Now, in the elderly, uh, this effect is, le uh, is less than in the young people. Now, the calcium uh, channel blockers, which are used mainly for high blood pressure, uh, in the elderly, they have a better or an enhanced effect on the regulation of blood pressure and also they cause less inhibition or less blockade on the uh, AV node. Now let's talk about some clinical issue for the geriatrics or the seniors. Now the primary goals for the clinical care for seniors 65 years and above is to maintain independence and number two to prevent any disability these are our aims or our goals so all healthcare professional must understand a concept called functional status this concept is very important okay for the healthcare providers to, in order to provide optimal care to their uh, seniors. Now, the functional status is a proxy measure for the patient's ability to live independently. And actually, this is very important for most seniors. They would like uh, to depend on their self, not on anybody else, like their uh, family members or on nurses or on so social workers. They want to do the job by themselves. So we need to help them, okay, to achieve this goal. Now, the functional status is determined by inquiring about the patient's ability to perform a specific task. We need to chat with the seniors. We need to talk with the seniors and to see which activities they would like to do themselves without the help of anybody else. So here we need actually full assessment of the functional status and that may include the psychological state, the financial resources, the physical function and the social circumstances. Now, most elderly have problems begin with the letter I. Like, for example, immobility, isolation, incontinence, inanition, which is malnutrition, impaction, impaired senses, instability, intellectual impairment, impotence, immunodeficiency, insomnia, and iatrogenesis. Okay? So the common eyes problems in the elderly uh, may be due to the underlying disease processes, and these problems may or may not be diagnosed by the health care providers. So the common problems in the elderly include Parkinson's disease, a benign prostate hypertrophy, glaucoma, hip fracture, post-herpetic neuralgia after developing shingles, falls, dementia, tuberculosis. 50% of the elderly they developed atypical symptoms to, and sometimes it's difficult to diagnose certain medical conditions. Okay, for example, when a senior or an elderly patient is suffering from a, an ischemic heart disease like myocardial infarction, heart attack, angina, they complain of syncope or weakness 
but they do not complain from chest pain like the uh, the uh, young people. So this is actually we call it atypical uh, symptoms, okay, unusual symptoms, unexpected symptoms, okay. Now confusion is the presenting symptom of acute abdominal problem in the elderly while uh, young people when they have an acute abdominal problem they suffer from severe pain uh, leukocytosis when we uh, estimate the number of white blood cells go higher and uh, rig uh, rigid abdominal muscles these symptoms are absent in some elderly okay now the atypical presentation could delay or could lead to misdiagnosis and that may lead to serious complication or consequences because of the misdiagnosis or the diagnosis is delayed because of the atypical uh, symptoms. <clears throat> now, the atypical symptoms or atypical presentation could be attributed to age-related physiologic changes to the presence of multiple comorbid illnesses, and also it could be attributed to compromise function and possibly to psychological stressors. Now, let's talk about the uh, atypical disease presentation in the elderly in more details. Now, let's talk about, for example, acute MI or heart attack. Now, for the young people, okay, uh, they suffer from chest pain. And here we suspect an MI. This is, we call it, typical symptom for acute MI. However, the seniors, they do not suffer from chest pain. They suffer from weakness, confusion, syncope, and abdominal pain. Now, regarding the ECG, when we do the ECG, okay, the, uh, uh, in a person having acute MI attack, whether the person is senior or non-senior, okay, uh, the results are the same. The, uh, the ECG looks similar, and the ECG actually here will help us to diagnose the MI in the elderly people while the symptoms or the presenting symptoms will not help us, maybe will confuse us. Now, when you come to the heart failure, the congestive cardiac failure, young people usually suffer from dyspnea or shortness of breath. This is the typical symptom of congestive cardiac failure. When we come to the uh, seniors, they have atypical or unusual symptoms like hypoxic symptoms, lethargy, restlessness, confusion, and these may confuse us and that can delay the diagnosis and the senior or the elderly patient could end up with serious complications. Now, we move next to the gastrointestinal bleeding. So if a young person is bleeding in his stomach, from his stomach, he will uh, complain from abdominal pain. That's the typical symptom of gastrointestinal bleeding, whereas the seniors, uh, they complain from non-specific symptoms or atypical symptoms, like they have altered mental status, uh, syncope, and some hemodynamic collapse. Okay, now we move to the upper respiratory tract infections. So if a young person is suffering from an upper 
respiratory tract infections. He will uh, have fever, chills, and productive coughs. These are the typical symptoms of upper respiratory tract infection, whereas the uh, elderly patient will have atypical symptoms, including lethargy, confusion, anorexia, a decompensation of the pre-existing medical condition. Now we move next to the UTI, urinary tract infection. If a young person is suffering from UTI, uh, the patient will have fever, flank pain, and dysuria. While the uh, senior or the elderly patient will have atypical symptoms including incontinence, confusion, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and azotemia. Okay, now in general, the elderly patients or the seniors have multiple comorbidities like osteoarthritis, heart disease, and diabetes mellitus. So let's talk about the drug-related problems in the elderly. Now, the medications that are used in the elderly uh, are aimed to improve the HR, the health-related quality of life. And sometimes, this could be associated with considerable negative outcomes, not positive outcomes. Why? Uh, now, the potentially preventable negative outcomes in the elderly due to drug-related problems may include adverse drug withdrawal events, or they call it ADWE therapeutic failure and adverse drug reactions. Now the adverse drug withdrawal events, okay, are associated with symptoms or signs due to the removal or discontinuation of the medication. Now the therapeutic failure could be due to inadequate a drug therapy or possibly to inappropriate a drug therapy and this is actually not related to the natural disease progression because some clinicians unfortunately they tell the patient because of your aging you are getting worse no it's not the aging the drug therapy is not appropriate. The dose may not be appropriate. We have to investigate be be before we tell the patient this is because of your aging. And sometimes uh, a prescriber makes a mistake and kill the patient. And when the family asks why our patient died, well, he died because his disease. Well, we have to know why. Actually, unfortunately, there are so many issues with the elderly people, and here the pharmacist can contribute uh, to help these patients and to prevent drug-related problems that may lead to morbidity or mortality. Okay? So the pharmacist is the safety valve. The doctor is very busy. He writes the prescription and sometimes he's not paying attention. But the pharmacist should pay attention and should stop, should stop the problem, should not expose the patient to any harm. This is our job as pharmacists to prevent harm, to act for the best interest of our patients. Now, some drug reaction, uh, adverse drug reactions could be associated 
with noxious or unintended reactions at the dosage in the humans which could be used for prophylaxis, prevention, diagnosis, or therapy or treatment. Now let's talk about the risk factors. Now, the overuse, oh my God, this is actually a very common problem. Overuse, polypharmacy, polypharmacy. I think polypharmacy is a critical issue and we need to pay attention. Uh, here in Canada, Health Canada should actually pay attention to this problem. Uh, we review the medication of the patient and we try to optimize the drug therapy, but sometimes pharmacists cannot, uh, uh, cannot eliminate the drugs, can, uh, even when the pharmacist suggests a discontinuation of a certain medication or a number of medication, the prescriber may refuse and the patient may refuse also. Unfortunately, some seniors love medication. The more you give them, the more happy they are. But these drugs are chemicals, are causing so many problems. So polypharmacy should be addressed, okay, by pharmacists, by prescribers, by nurses. We have to make something to stop polypharmacy, okay? Now, the polypharmacy could be either to the concomitant use of multiple drugs. Honestly, I have some patients using 15, 20 medication. I don't know how they take them and how many side effects these medication will develop. Also, it could be due to the administration of more medication than indicated or than required clinically. So here in, in one study, they found that uh, some elderly may be using two to nine medication including prescription and non prescription medication. But the, practically speaking, we have so many patients on 15 to 20 medications per day. Now, polypharmacy uh, in the elderly could be associated with so many problems like falls, especially when the uh, seniors are taking drugs affecting the central nervous system, uh, cognitive impairment, uh, decreased functional status, increased healthcare costs, uh, possibly billions of dollars are being lost every year because of the increased healthcare costs due to polypharmacy. So pharmacists actually can contribute uh, to this problem, but they need also a response from the prescriber and from the patient and from the health authorities. Uh, one of the problem is we call inappropriate prescribing, or we call it irrational prescribing. Uh, meaning prescribing medication outside the bounds of the accepted medical standard. And this is very common. Practically speaking, it is very common. Now, in the hospitals, they have dispensing pharmacists. Pharmacists who supply the medication to the patient in the hospital. Okay? They have nothing to do with the uh, medications that the patient is using. They don't do uh, uh, medication review, okay? They, they only supply medication and they don't know whether these medication are correct or not correct because this is the responsibility of the prescriber. Why? Because here, hospitals, they do not have a budget to employ a clinical pharmacist 
This is actually the solution of polypharmacy. We need the clinical pharmacists in hospitals. Okay. Uh, there are some uh, 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 actually uh, uh, family health uh, clinics. Uh, they have uh, clinical pharmacists, but the presence of clinical pharmacists in the hospital is of utmost importance, okay, uh, in order to optimize a drug therapy for the patients that are admitted to the hospital, particularly to the seniors who are on polypharmacy. So the clinical uh, pharmacies in the hospitals, I think it's cost effective because the government will say, or Health Canada will say, I don't have a budget to pay salaries for these pharmacists. What are they going to do? I have doctors and I have nurses. Well, what is happening now the doctor prescribe and the nurse do the medication review and actually she does not have any input on the medication review. She copies what the far we, we, in the pharmacy we send them the medication history of the patient. She copies that medication in the form and the doctor comes and also uh, confirm it. Okay, sometimes he may change a dose or he may discontinue of medication but the medication enters with the 20 medication and discharge with the 25 medication sometimes is this a clinical diagnosis i don't think so okay we are not losing billions of dollars because of polypharmacy we are also exposing the patient to more side effect to more adverse drug reaction okay and this is another burden or cost for the healthcare system so the uh, employment okay of a clinical pharmacist in the hospital is cost effective and these pharmacists will save billions of dollars if you calculate their salaries in millions they will save you billions Please think about it and take action. So here the clinical pharmacist in the hospital will review the medication of the patient when admitted and also will give feedback to the prescribers that these drugs are not necessary, remove them. The doses are inappropriate, correct them there are drug interaction stop them and also when the patient is discharged the clinical pharmacist will review the uh, medication and also the clinical pharmacist may also follow up with the patient after discharge and also we as community pharmacists this is our job we can do the follow-up okay we have no authority. We can say just actually, but unfortunately, most of the time, the patient refuses to uh, 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 to uh, take our suggestion, and prescribers, some of them, they refuse this suggestion. But the clinical pharmacist in the hospital may help these patients. So. Also, the clinical pharmacists in the hospitals have the ability, okay, have the knowledge, they have the skills to prevent and manage drug-related problems. Clinical pharmacists can give feedback to prescribers to optimize the drug therapy and also to prevent polypharmacy. So the bottom line of this presentation, pharmacist can optimize a drug therapy for the elderly. They can decrease drug related problems and they can prevent wasting the healthcare budget on unnecessary polypharmacy. Thank you very much 
for listening and watching and I hope to see you in another presentation soon. Have a wonderful day.